This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. All right, we're going to now turn to our last topic of the quarter, and that is Space the Final Frontier. A quick trip to some of the um, fascination and mysteries of the higher dimensional Fourier transform. Actually, one of the things that I want to convince you of is that there are no mysteries to the higher dimensional Fourier transform, or at least not so many. Uh, because our goal is to try to make the higher dimensional case look as much as possible like the one dimensional case. So that all that you learned, that hard one knowledge, same thing we sort of did when we were looking at the discrete Fourier transform, to try to carry over your intuition from one setting to another setting. So all the stuff you learned, all the formulas you learned, will find counterparts uh, in the higher, in the, all the stuff you learned in the one dimensional case will find counterparts in the higher dimensional case. All right? Now, it, this is not just, so here's the topic, higher dimensional, Fourier transforms. And by that, I really mean Fourier transforms of functions of several variables. That's what it means to talk about higher dimensional Fourier transforms, i.e., Fourier transforms of functions of more than one variable. Now, this is not an idle generalization by any means. It's not generalization for generalization's sake. Uh, these days, you're as likely to find, I think this is not too much of an exaggeration, to say you're as likely to find applications of for a analysis spectral and signal processing and so on to functions of more than one variable as you are functions of one variable, at least two or three variables. And uh, I think a leading example of this, for instance, is in the Fourier analysis of imaging. All right. So you find many, there are many applications. applications of the higher dimensional theory, higher dimensional Fourier transforms. For example, e.g. images or the Fourier analysis of images, spectral analysis, let me put it that way. Spectral analysis and what is almost the same thing, signal processing for images. All right. For what is an image, after all? all right. What is the mathematical description of an image? Well, at least a two-dimensional image. Well, at least mathematically, it's given by a function of two variables, say x1 and x2. Function f of x1, x2, where x1 and x2 are varying over some part of the x1, x2 plane. And at each point, what the function prescribes is the intensity. I'm thinking about black and white images here. So you think of f of x1 and x2 as a range of numbers from 0 to 1, from black to white. So you think of x1, x, think of f of x1, x2 as the intensity from black to white, say. at the point x1, x2. And then as x1 and x2 vary over the plane, the intensity vary, re, uh, vary over a region of the plane, the intensity varies and that's what makes an image. All right, that what ma that's what makes a black and white image. Color is more complicated, all right? But at least for black and white images, that's what you get. Now you're used to this, you're used to actually the more discrete version of this in the digital version where the intensity is quantized to 256 levels and so on. But you can think of this first as uh, in the continuous case where, the, where x1 and x2, x1, x2 are varying continuously over a region and the intensity is varying, say, continuously from black to white. That's what describes an image. Now the question is, this you might think of as the spatial description of an image. It's what you see with your senses. It's like the spatial or the, te the temporal, the time description of sound, what you hear with your ears. So this is the spatial description. Uh, description of an image. It's what you perceive. And the question is, man, my writing is just, the end of the quarter is 
Getting a little tough here, what you perceive. I'll get out of the way. The question is, the question the Fourier analysis raises is, is there another description? Is there a spectral description? Can you describe an image in terms of its component parts like you can describe a sound in terms of its component parts? Right. Is there a spectral description? Can you analyze an image into simpler components? like you can analyze a sound in the simpler components. And if you can, of course, that gives you a certain amount of control over it. If you can manipulate the component parts, you can manipulate the image. In the same way as if you can manipulate the harmonics that go into a sound, you can manipulate the sound. All right, to take, to take one example of it. There are other sorts of examples like this, but just, just keep this one in mind because it's a very natural example, it's a very important example. And the answer, of course, is yes, and it's provided Exactly, in this case, by the two-dimensional Fourier transform, and then in higher dimensions, similar sorts of problems are provided by the higher dimensional Fourier transform. So, yes, is yes, the, the spectral analysis, spectral description, um, is provided by the two-dimensional Fourier transform. And the component parts are the two-dimensional complex exponentials. It's a very close analogy to what happens in the one-dimensional case. And that's really what I, want to, what I want to push. The component parts, the component, you know, component parts, the components are the 2D complex exponentials. All right. And the same things hold in higher dimensions. So again, as we understand these things and as we go through the formulas, the thing that I want to emphasize is that the two-dimensional case and the higher dimensional case can be made to look very much like the one-dimensional case. And furthermore, there's no essential difference between the two-dimensional case and the higher dimensional case. There, is, there are differences in going from one to two dimensions. Some of the formulas are a little bit different. There are, there are new phenomena that come in in going from one dimension to two dimensions. You have two degrees of freedom instead of one degree of freedom. Naturally, some things are going to be richer all right, in the two-dimensional case. That's true. But there's more similarity than there is difference, I'd say, between the one-dimensional case and the two-dimensional case. And certainly, there is very little difference between the two-dimensional case and the higher dimensional case. All right? So we want to make the 2D case and higher look like the 1D case, all right? There are differences, and we'll highlight, we'll be, and, and matter of fact, by making them look as, look as similar as we can, it'll make the differences also stand out when there are differences. But again, certainly there, there's, more, there's more similarities than there are differences, and there are very few differences between the two-dimensional case and higher dimensional cases, all right? So if you get that down, then um, you're in pretty good shape, all right? So this is, I consider this good news. That is, that the, the, the things we've learned so far will have, as I say, counterparts uh, and analogs in the higher dimensional setting. All right? Now, the key to doing this, the key to making it look very similar, is really how you write the formulas. And um, the way you write the formulas is with vector notation. All right? So the key to doing this, that is, to making the cases look the same, is to use, whenever possible, is to think in terms of vectors. Write the formulas, et cetera, at all with vectors. All right. There are different ways of motivating this. I'm going to really pretty much jump into it. So let me write down the one-dimensional case, the one-dimensional formula for the Fourier transform, and see what has to be replaced and what has to change. And again, how I can make it look, how I can make the higher dimensional case look like the one dimensional case. So here's the one dimensional Fourier transform, as we've written down many times. The Fourier transform of a function is the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus 2 pi i st 
f of t dt. Wonderful. All right. Now, what goes into that? So I have one-dimensional continuous variables s and t are sort of, so to speak, 1D continuous variables. All right. The function that I'm taking the Fourier transform of is a function of that one variable and the Fourier the variable t. And the Fourier transform is a function also of that one variable s. All right. f of t is a function of t. The Fourier transform f of s is a function of s. And of course, the other thing that happens here, the other big, the other big element that enters into the definition of the Fourier transform is the complex exponential. And there, it's the product of the variables s and t that come in. That's what it takes to define the Fourier transform. And of course, there's the integral and everything else. I mean, you know, it's not that many symbols, but it's a pretty complicated expression. In e to the minus 2 pi i s t, it's the product of s and t enters. OK, now. What about the higher dimensional case? So let's do the, just do the two dimensional case. All right. What do I replace the variables by? What do I replace the functions by? And so on. All right. So instead of single functions of a continuous variable, I have, say, uh, a vector function x, a vector variable x, that's a function of two variables. That'll be the so called spatial variable. All right. So you can think of it as just a pair of numbers, x1 and x2. But again, I'm going to write that as a vector in most cases. And then the frequency, I'm going to write with a Greek letter xi. That's a pretty standard term. And it, if you haven't learned to write a Greek letter xi, this is your big chance. That's a pair of numbers, x1, x2. And that'll be thought of as the frequency variable. All right. Then the function that I'm going to be taking the transform of is not a function just of one variable alone, but it's a function of the vector variable x, or it's a function of x1 and x2. Function to be transformed is f of x, if I write it just like that in the vector notation, or f of x1, x2. All right. And the Fourier transform is likewise going to be a function of the frequency variable, which is the pair c1 and c2. Fourier transform will be something like the Fourier transform of f. I'll use the same notation of the vector variable, the frequency variable, c, or if I write it out as a pair, c1, c2. OK, now the big, but <laughs> how do I actually make the definition? What happens to the complex exponential? How do I replace multiplication of the variables s and t, the one-dimensional variables s and t in the one-dimensional case, by a sort of higher dimensional analog? So what happens with the complex exponential? All right. You replace the product st in the one-dimensional case by the dot product or the inner product of the two variables that enter into the, into the higher dimensional case. That is the spatial variable and the frequency variable. You replace this by x dot c, the inner product. So that's x1 times c1 plus x2 times c2. So the complex exponential then is e to the minus 2 pi i x dot c, or c dot x doesn't matter, it's same same thing which is e to the minus 2 pi i x1 times c1 plus x2 times c2. 
Okay? That's what replaces the complex exponential. If you write it like this, in vector notation with the inner product, it looks pretty much as much as you can make it like the one-dimensional case. Putting all this together, what is the definition of the Fourier transform? Now, realize here, by the way, this is still, I'm computing a scalar here. I haven't done any, you know, this is the ordinary uh, exponential function because x dot c is a, is a number, is a scalar. So I'm taking e to the minus 2 pi i times a scalar. That's nothing new, all right? The fact that that scalar is arising as the inner product of two vectors, well, okay, that's something new. But nevertheless, I haven't introduced a new function here. I've only replaced the multiplication of the one-dimensional variables, s and t, by the inner product of the two-dimensional variables, x and c. So with all this, what is the definition of the Fourier transform? It is defined by the Fourier transform. Let me write it in vector form first, and then I'll write it out in terms of components. The Fourier transform of f at the, at the vector variable c is the integral over r2, the integral over the entire plane, of e to the minus 2 pi i x dot c, c f of x dx. All right? Looks as much like the one-dimensional case as I can make it look. All right, well, I've replaced scalar variables, one-dimensional variables by vector variables x and c. And for that matter, this same definition holds in, well, let me write it out in components. All right. Before I say anything about higher dimensions. So in components, this says that the Fourier transform of f at c1, c2, the pair of frequency variables, that integral over r2 becomes a double integral. That's the integral from minus infinity to infinity, the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus 2 pi i x1 times c1 plus x2 times c2 times f of x1 comma x2 times dx1 dx2. Same formula, but it's now everything is written out in terms of components. Now, which would you rather write? This, which took the entire blackboard, or this, which took the entire blackboard, but a little bit less of the entire blackboard, all right? Okay, this you can recognize, really, as the same form as the one-dimensional Fourier transform. This sort of looks the same, but it's a little bit more complicated, all right? You need both. This we're going to need, actually, we're going to need to write things out in terms of components when we actually compute for specific Fourier transforms. But if we want to understand the Fourier transform in higher dimensions and we want to work with it conceptually, then it's by far better to write things in vector form. The formulas, you know, the theorems that govern the higher dimensional case, to, and to the extent that we can make them analogous to the one dimensional case, and it really is to a great extent, they are much better understood if we use the vector notation and that sort of form for the Fourier transform. So let me just say that now the higher dimensional case is exactly uh, an extension of this, from two dimensions to n dimensions. So in n dimensions, the spatial variable is a function of n variables, all right? The frequency variable also is an n-tuple, c, c1 up through cn, all right? And again, multiplication is replaced by the inner product, x dot c is x1 times c1 plus up to xn times cn. So, th up to cn. so this time, the function you're taking the transform of is a function of n variables. The Fourier transform is also a function of n variables. But the definition looks the same. And I will not write it out in terms of components. Let me just write out the vector form of it. So the Fourier transform of f at c, the vector variable, is the integral over rn of, same thing, e to the minus 2 pi i x dot c c times f of x dx. Same thing, same formula, except this time I'm integrating over all of space, n-dimensional space, instead of just the plane. And I will demur from writing, trying to write this out in components, all right, x1 through xn. 
but you can. But you see the economy of writing things in the vector notation. All right, it just makes things much, much simpler to write. And again, I contend, and I hope to show you, that it also makes it much simpler to understand things conceptually, understand how the formulas are conceptually if you stick with a vector case. I should mention that, of course, one also has the inverse Fourier transform. And by analogy, it looks very similar to the regular Fourier, to the, to the, for, the, to the Fourier transform, the forward Fourier transform, except I changed the plus to a minus, or rather minus to a plus, in the complex exponential. So the inverse Fourier transform, let's say it's the inverse Fourier transform of g, it's a function of the spatial variable, is the integral from r, over Rn. I'll do it in the n-dimensional case for the thrill of it. e to the plus 2 pi i x dot c say g of c d c, okay? Which looks the same as the one-dimensional inverse Fourier transform, okay? Now, I'm not gonna, you know, when time comes, I'll talk about Fourier inversion, all the rest of that stuff, but again, it, it's gonna be, it's gonna work out the same way as in the one-dimensional case. There are some differences, again, to be sure, but the basic ideas, the basic phenomena that hold in the one-dimensional case are also gonna hold in the two-dimensional case and the higher-dimensional case. All right, works out just beautifully, just beautifully. I should say one other thing here. Um, what about the dimensions of the variables involved, or the unit? Yeah, dimensions. I guess not units so much, but dimensions. Keep that up there. So again, there is a. And we'll see different versions of this, different instances of this. There's a reciprocal relationship between the, between the spatial domain and the frequency domain. In the one-dimensional case, we refer to the time domain and the frequency domain. In the higher dimensional case, we think more in terms of the x is a spatial variable rather than a time variable, naturally, because that's where the problems come from. Uh, and there is a reciprocal relationship between the spatial domain and the frequency domain. So this time you talk about the two domains of the spatial domain and the frequency domain. What is the first instance of it, reciprocal? relationship between the spatial domain and the frequency domain. Now we'll see uh, various instances of this, again, mostly analogous to the one-dimensional case, but even in the, in the, in the two-dimensional case, what do I mean by this? Well, if I think of the vector variable x as x1 through xn as the spatial variable, then I would imagine the xi's each have dimension length, right? So if this is a spatial variable, then xi has dimension length, right? All right, so what dimension should the frequency variable have if I'm going to take the inner If you think of physically, mathematically, we never care about dimensions, you know? But people who work in physics, especially in applications, they always, they always like to attach units to, their units to their variables as a way of sort of checking that the formulas make sense. So to form x dot c, so to form x dot c, and sort of have it make sense physically, that's x1 times c1 plus x2 times c2 plus and so on, xn times cn. To make, this, to, make sense, to make this sense physically, to make sense out of this physically, you would want the c's to have dimension 1 over, one over length. All right, so it's length times 1 over length gives you a number, gives you a scalar so you can add them all up. You would want the ci to have dimension 1 over length, the reciprocal of length. That's the reciprocal relationship between space and frequency. All right, if, this, if the x's have dimension length as describing the spatial variable, then in the frequency domain, the, the, the variables have dimension 1 over length. It's analogous to time and frequency, timing have, time having the dimension, or time having the dimension time, or say units seconds and uh, the frequency having, having units 1 over second, or hertz, okay? Same thing, same thing. 
So this is sort of the first natural uh, example of the reciprocal relationship between the two domains. Analogous, again, analogous to the, 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 what happens in the one-dimensional case. Cool? I think so. I mean, I like this stuff. <laughs> All right, now, let me talk about, so this is the, this is the formula. Now, again, I, I sort of just, I presented this to you as directly analogous, as close as I can make it, to the one-dimensional case. You, of course, there are ways of, you know, you can get to the higher-dimensional Fourier transform the way, in a similar way as you can get to the one-dimensional Fourier transform by considering higher-dimensional Fourier series and sort of limiting cases of higher-dimensional Fourier series and so on. I'm not going to do that. We have a, there's a lot of water under the bridge between when we started and where we are now. So uh, I'm not going to revisit all those ideas, and I'm not going to talk about, uh, there's a, there's a, there is a section in the notes on a nice application, I think, of higher dimensional Fourier series, but it's not, it's not something I want to I talk about in public. Um, so we're going to really go pretty much directly for the, uh, for the main ideas and the main applications of this thing without, um, unfortunately, somehow taking some of the many fascinating little side routes that we're going we're gonna to go on, but that you could go on. But again, you know, it's the, 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 you, there are ways of motivating the definition of the higher dimensional Fourier transform. That is, there are mo ways of motivating why you replace multiplication of the one-dimensional variables S and T with the inner product. I mean, why that's, that's, a, that's a natural thing to do, um, rather than just, like I say, my presenting it as a, by fiat, that this is how we're going to do it. Now, let me write down the formula again, again in vector form. I want to say something more about, so again, there, as I said, if you consider that what we want to do is we want to try to develop the spectral picture of higher dimensional signals, then the aspects of that are defining the Fourier transform and then understanding what the components are. And the components in this case are these higher dimensional complex exponentials. So I would like to spend a little bit of time making sure we understand and sort of getting us, helping to get a feeling for what the complex exponentials are, what these higher dimensional complex exponentials are, how you can understand them geometrically, how you can, if you can't quite visualize them, at least somehow how you can put them in your head in some reasonable way other than just a formula. So again, let me write down the formula for the Fourier transform. The integral, I'll just do, let me just do the two-dimensional case. So that in the two-dimensional case is the integral over the plane, e to the minus 2 pi i x dot c, f of x dx. And what I want to talk a little bit about is the nature of the 2D complex exponential. E to the two pi, either plus or minus two pi i x dot c. I put plus or minus in there because you know it's a minus sign that comes in for the inverse for the Fourier transform. It's the plus sign that comes in for the inverse Fourier transform. It doesn't matter. All right, they have the same nature whether or not you consider plus or minus 2 pi i times x dot c. Okay, so, now. You can't really, you can't draw a picture, they're, they're complex functions, so you can't really draw a picture of it, you can't draw a graph of these things. But there are ways of understanding it geometrically. So again, let's think of, let me say, you can't draw a graph. like you can draw a graph of sines and cosines, but you can understand geometrically. Understand it geometrically. In particular, you can understand frequency almost in terms, almost, you can get a very intuitive sense or tactile sense of frequency, what it means to have high frequency, what it means to have low frequency, and so on, okay? You can get an understanding, you can get a feeling for the sort of vector frequency. All right, now, let's go back for a second to the one-dimensional case. Just to set the stage for this, because again, I want to, I want to pursue by analogy here. So let's, let's go back to the 1D case where I'm looking at e to the 2 pi, I'll, I'll, look, at, I'll look at the plus sign, okay? just so I don't have to write the minus sign in there. So e to the 2 pi i s t, where s is the frequency variable and t is the time variable. All right, so imagine, fix the frequency, okay? Fix s. Fix the frequency s, and look at this as a function of t. Look at e to the 2 pi i s t as a function 
of t. All right? Then it is periodic of period 1 over s. As a function of t, as a function of t, it's periodic of period 1 over s. Okay? That's e to the 2 pi i s times t plus 1 over s is e to the 2 pi i s t times e to the 2 pi i s times 1 over s. So it's e to the 2 pi i t times e to the 2 pi i, it's just e to the 2 pi i s t. Again, s is fixed here, you know, 2, 3, 5, 12, whatever. Okay? All right, so that already tells you something about, you know, how rapidly, again, you can't draw a picture here, but you can say the words. How rapidly is this complex exponential oscillating depending on s? Well, if s is large, then 1 over s is small, the period is small, so it's oscillating fast. It's, 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 it's returning to the, same, to, the, to, to the same value over and over again very quickly. If s is small, 1 over s is large, the period is large. All right, so that gives you a sense of how fast the function is oscillating, how fast the function e to the 2 pi i s t is oscillating as a function of t, depending on the size of s. Or another way of looking at this is um, e to the 2 pi i s t will be equal to 1 at the points, well, t equals 0, t equals uh, 1 over s or minus 1 over s, so plus or minus 1 over s, t equals plus or minus 2 over s, and so on and so on. All right? So although It's a complex function, it's a, and you can't draw the graph. You can say, well, it's returning to the value 1 at spacing, at point space 1 over s apart. All right? So e to the 2 pi s is equal to 1. e to the 2 pi i s t is equal to 1 at points spaced 1 over s apart. All right? So again, if s is large, if you have a high frequency, then those spacing is very small. If s is small, you have a low frequency, then 1 over s is large, the points are spaced far apart. Okay, so it gives you a, a sort of a tactile description of how fast the function is oscillating, how often it assumes the value 1. Okay? This is all in the one-dimensional case. And I don't think, I don't know if I ever really spoke in these terms when we talk about the complex exponentials, but this is not should not be too much for you to get your head around, all right? We've worked with complex, one-dimensional complex exponentials a lot. If I, didn't, if I didn't say this before, maybe I should have. Now, what about the two-dimensional case? What about the two-dimensional case? the 2D case, where my complex exponentials are the form e to the 2 pi i x dot c, or if I write it out in components, that's e to the 2 pi i x1 times c1 plus x2 times c2. Okay? All right, so again, I'm going to fix a frequency and look at this as a function of x1 and x2. So I want to fix c, c1, c2 a given frequency. All right, I'm not going to talk about high frequencies or low frequencies yet, but I will. All right, but just imagine fixing a frequency and look at that complex exponential as a function of x1 and x2. That is, as a function of the x1, x2 plane. And look at e to the 2 pi i I'll write it out in components, c1 plus C, uh, x2 times c2 as a function of x1 and x2, okay? All right, now, by analogy to um, 
what I did in the one-dimensional case, when is the complex exponential equal to 1? All right? when, does this, when does this function as a function of c1 and c2 are fixed, when does this function assume the value 1? Where is e to the 2 pi i x1 times c1 plus x2 times c2 equal to 1? Well, don't get too far ahead of things here. That will be true for points x1 and x2. So again, c1 and c2 is fixed, so I'm asking this as a function of x1 and x2. Okay? This will be so at points x1, x2, where the inner product, x1 times c1 plus x2 times c2 equals an integer, n. So n can be 0, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, and so on. Okay? At those points in the x1, x2 plane, this complex exponential will be equal to 1. All right, that's just the property of the ordinary exponential. See, we're going to be e to the 2 pi i n. Now, what are these points? x1, x2. It's not hard to see, all right? And I'll show you, let me show you how this goes. It's very pretty. You get a very pretty picture here. And again, this is a picture, if you've studied imaging already, you have probably seen this picture. I don't know how it's presented in those courses, but let's present it here. Again, let's push it here as an analog of the classical, of the one-dimensional case. All right, let, let me look at the case n equals zero, all right? What about the points x1, c1, plus x2, c2 equals zero? What are those points? So again, c1 and c2 are fixed, like, you know, five times x1 plus three times x2 equals zero. You know, 3 times x1 plus 5 times x2 equals 0, minus x1 plus 4 times x2 equals 0, and so on. All right? So again, c1 and c2 are fixed. What, are the, what does this set of points look like in the complex plane? We well, have to remember a little analytic geometry here. Okay? You need to remember analytic, and let me just say analytic vector geometry. That is, the set of points in the x1, x2 plane where x1 times c1 plus x2 times c2 is equal to 0 is a line through the origin. So here's the x1, x2 plane. And I mean, if I wrote it like this, 3x1 plus 5x2 is equal to 0, or minus x1 plus 4x2 is equal to 0, you'd probably recognize, and if I said, what is that figure, you would probably say, it's a line through the origin. All right? That's fine. But you also have to remember the relationship of c1 and c2 to that line. What is the relationship? Is It's a line through the origin with the vector c as the normal vector. All right, x1 times c1 plus x2 times c2 equals 0 is a line through the origin in the x1, x2 plane with c as the normal vector. Not the unit normal vector, it doesn't have length 1, I'm not assuming that, but it's, but it's, it's perpendicular to the line. Okay, it's normal to the line. All right. So, so, going back to what we're describing here, for example, e to the 2, so, e to the 2 pi i x1 times c1 plus x2 times c2 is equal to is equal to 1 along that line along that line because along this line x1 times c1 plus x2 times c2 is equal to 0 so it's e to the 0 is 1 okay now what about all the other places where it's equal to 1 that is 
C1 plus C1, X1 times C1 plus X2 times C2 plus E2 is equal to N for N equals 0, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, and so on. What are those configurations in the X1, X2 plane? So now what is a description of all of all the po of the points where x1 c1 plus x2 times c2 is equal to n n equals 0 plus or minus 1 plus or minus 2 and so on and so on well each one of these things let me just do one more example x1 times c1 plus x2 times c2 is equal to 1 is another line with the same normal vector but not through the origin with normal vector C, but not through the origin. But not through the origin. As a matter of fact, the picture would look, say, something like this. Here's the x1, x2 plane. Here's the line x1. Here's the line. Let me write in vector notation. x dot c equals 0. And here is the line x dot c equals 1. It's parallel to this line because it has the same normal vector. Right? But it doesn't pass through the origin. This is c, and this is c. All right? Now, how far apart are these lines? What is the spacing? How far apart are these lines? All right, so the two lines, this one and this one, all right? Here's a point here. How do, I find that? How do I find the distance between the two lines? Well, I'm going to find it using vectors. All right. I take a point, x1, x2, on that line. All right. And that's, that point satisfies x1 times c1 plus x2 times c2 is equal to 1. That's the defining property of the line. All right. Call this angle theta. All right then what I want is, I want the, this is, let me call this as a vector x, then the distance between the two lines is the magnitude of x times the cosine of theta. Magnitude of x times the cosine of theta. For any point, x1, x2 on the line, okay? But what is the magnitude of x times the cosine of theta in terms of inner products? Well, remember, x dot c is equal to the magnitude of x times the magnitude of c times cosine of theta. All right, the basic geometric property of dot products. That is to say, the magnitude of x times cosine of theta is x dot c divided by the magnitude of c. All right? But what is x dot c? I'm waiting for the TV to come on. 1. All right? Anywhere along this line, x dot c is equal to 1. So it is equal to 1 over the magnitude of c. How far apart are the lines spaced? The lines are spaced 1 over the magnitude of c apart. So again, I'll draw the picture. Here's the line x dot c equals 0. Here's the line x dot c equals 1. How far, how far apart are they? The spacing distance is equal to the reciprocal 
of the length of C. All right? Now, same thing holds for all those other lines. Which other lines? I mean, when the inner product is equal to an integer. 0, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, and so on and so on. That gives you a family of parallel, evenly spaced lines in the plane. So x dot c equals n for n equals 0, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, and so on and so on, gives you a family of parallel. All that, they all have normal vector c. Lines uh, in the pl parallel, evenly spaced, lines. And what is the spacing? The spacing is 1 over C. So the picture is again something like this. I can only draw so many of these things. Here's the, here's the line through the origin. Here's the line corresponding to say n equals 1. Here's the line corresponding to n equals 2. Here's the line corresponding to n equals minus 1, minus 2, whatever, you know. Here's x dot c equals 2. Here's x dot c equals 1. Here's x dot c equals 0, and so on and so on. They all have this, they're all parallel. They all have the same normal vector, and the spacing is the same. The spacing between any two lines, any two adjacent lines, is 1 over c. Part. All right, now, I want to remind you why we do this. Let's go back to the complex exponential. All right? So that says e to the 2 pi i x dot c. is equal to 1 along each one of these lines. OK? So it's equal to 1 here. Then it oscillates, then it's equal to 1, equal to 1, equal to 1, and so on and so on. It's a complex function. You can't draw the picture. But you can say that it's somehow it's oscillating up and down. Up and down, again, is not really the right thing to say because it's complex. You can't talk about up and down with a complex. But it's, but it's, but it's oscillating. Uh, and it's equal to 1, then it oscillates, then it's 1, 1, 1, 1, and so on and so on. As a matter of fact, to be a little more precise here, and I'll let you sort this out. It's in the notes. You can say that e to the 2 pi i x dot c is periodic in the direction c with period 1 over the magnitude of C. All right? I will leave it to you. Well, I think I, this is discussed in the notes, but I'll leave it to you to read that or make that precise. But that's the closest analogy you can have in the two-dimensional case to the one-dimensional case. All right? If I just imagine myself in the x1 and x2 plane going off in a certain direction, all right, then if I go off in that direction, this function is going to be periodic, and it's going to be periodic of period 1 over C. It oscillates. It goes up to 1, down, up to 1. Again, I, I, can't, I, I can't resist somehow. can't help myself from saying up and down. But the idea is that it oscillates, and it returns to the value 1 along each one of these lines. And if you look back, this is not a bad analogy. It's a pretty close analogy to the way we looked at the complex exponential, to the way you can visualize or imagine the complex exponential in the one-dimensional case. All right? In particular, it gives you a sense of what it means to have a high frequency and a low frequency harmonic. So if you think of these complex exponentials as a two-dimensional harmonic, you, can get a, you get a sense of what it means to, be, to have a high frequency harmonic or a low frequency harmonic. A high frequency harmonic would be if the magnitude of C is large. High frequency means the magnitude of C is large. All right? That means 1 over C is small. All right? 
That means these lines are spaced close together. That means there's rapid oscillation. Okay. So close spacing of the lines, rapid oscillation of the complex exponential. All right, and low frequency would mean would mean the magnitude of C is small. Low frequency means that the magnitude of C is small. That means that one over magnitude of C is large. That means the spacing is large, the line spacing is large, and I have a slow oscillation. So uh, far spacing of the lines. And I have a slow oscillation of the complex exponential. Okay? Now, again, you have to be a little more careful. It's, it's richer in two dimensions than it is in one dimension because the harmonics don't just have a magnitude associated with it. Don't just have a, 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 you can't just say how fast or how slow it's oscillating. You also have to specify the direction. All right? The frequency is a vector quantity in, in two dimensions and in higher dimensions, right? not a scalar quantity. So you have to talk about it's oscillating slowly in a given direction. And it'll be different depending on the, on the frequency. right? If you change the frequency, you're changing both it, you might change both its magnitude and its direction. All right? So you can change those two independently. It might be oscillating rapidly in one direction and slowly in another direction. Okay? Get what I mean? So it's a richer, it's a richer picture. And we'll talk about this. And there, there, are some, there are pictures of it also. That are discussed, that are given in the notes. All right, but this is, I should say, maybe the, the geometric way, the geometric interpretation. Again, you can't. I'm, I hesitate to say you, this is how you visualize complex exponentials, vector two-dimensional complex exponentials, because I'm not sure you're really visualizing them, because they're complex functions. But again, you are you are seeing from this how they're oscillating, in what ways they're oscillating, in what way they generalize the one-dimensional uh, complex exponential. In this case, you have lines. Uh, where, the, where the functions are equal to 1. In some areas, in optics, for example, you usually refer to these lines as lines of constant phase. All right? There's no phase. The, com the complex exponential is real on those lines. So you, you sometimes refer to that as constant phase. You know, it varies. All right? I think the terminology varies. I don't necessarily want to attach any one particular interpretation or any one particular terminology to it. I think the picture itself holds regardless of the interpretation or regardless of the setting, and that's what you should think of. Okay? All right. So. We have now done, we have, we have the basic formula for the Fourier transform, uh, the components that go into it, and the, that is the, the, the particular elements that enter into it, and some understanding, I hope, of the components into which a higher dimensional signal is broken. That is, these complex exponentials and what they represent. Next time, we will develop, we will get to know our higher dimensional Fourier transform, and you will see how the theorems in the one dimensional case carry over to the higher dimensional case where they're similar and where they're different. All that is waiting for us. See you then.